Someone asked me what this podcast was all about and who we serve. And, and that's a really great question. I started this podcast because in my experience, most people in leadership roles, whether as business owners or managers, were never really trained to be leaders. Some leaders were amazing workers and were told, hey, you are amazing. Come be a manager and you can teach everybody everything you know and how you do what you do. And then you left a flounder or you became a leader because you have a business. In both cases, you were never trained to be an effective leader. But how do you become an effective leader? And that's coming up next on Marcane Live. Welcome to this episode of Mark Hain Live. This is where small business owners and entrepreneurs pick up core skill sets to help them work on their business, not just in their business. I am your host, service expert, and master of experiences, Mark Hain. And today, I am so thrilled to be talking about leadership. Now, we do have a little bit of a glitch. My guest today is not able to connect. And so I'm, I want to go through a little bit about what leadership is and how you can take steps in to become a more heroic leader. But um, I will connect with our guest speaker and re release a formal version of our presentation today. But I want you to stay with us because at the end of it, I'm still going to be talking a little bit about what leadership is and, and what it is not, and we'll get to that in just a moment. First off, before we get any further, I just want to thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really grateful that you're here, that you're taking in this content. I'm hoping that you perused my whole library of episodes. This is episode number 69. And so, you know, we've been going now since March 2020, since the, the kickoff of the, the pandemic. So I'm hoping that you get extraordinary results from today's content. And if you do find the information valuable, please go ahead and share it on social media. And of course, if you haven't done so, go ahead and subscribe to this program. Um, again, you know, my whole purpose to do this is because I want to help you, the leader, the business person, the manager, pick up skill sets that will help make you better. I know that when I was first promoted, I was thrilled. I mean, I really was uh, in a position where I was working with a bunch of people for a couple of years. I, I was working with my friends and I thought it was amazing. I was 17 years old working at McDonald's. You know, McDonald's, no matter what anybody says about the McDonald's and working in fast food, you know, they taught you how to work. And I was approached when I was just about to turn 18 years old and asked if I wanted to become a manager. And I thought, this will be amazing. This will be great. You know, I, I will become promoted. I will have my friends. I will be able to rock the house because they were my friends. But like many people, I wasn't trained. <laughs> I had no way of knowing how to engage and drive my team. Uh, it was awful. And so I have to ask you, what was your first experience like as a leader? And that brings us to our question of the day. Go ahead and share your experience on social media. I'd love to make this a point of conversation because I know so many leaders as I've gone through and kind of interviewed business operators and managers and that sort of thing, we talked about how they got started and all the adjustments that they had to make. And it was really, really tough. And there were so many different adjustments you had to make. As I mentioned, when I first got promoted, I thought it was going to be a cakewalk. I thought it was going to be one of those things that I'll get into the position. All my friends would support me. They would, you know, I'd be on solid, solid ground and I would score high points with the head manager and so on. But that didn't quite work out. I was everybody's friend. I was making sure I took care of everybody and make sure that I gave them whatever they wanted. My idea was if they're happy, if they get everything they want, then I am never going to have a problem. They will be in my corner. I soon realized very quickly that they weren't necessarily in my corner. They, I think everybody wanted to do well, but then I started getting comments about how much I've changed. 
And I wasn't prepared for that. And it wasn't that I changed as a person. I think more than anything else, I changed because my job responsibilities changed. And so I had an expectation of my team. My team had an expectation of me. And I'm not to this day not quite sure what that was. Maybe they expected, hey, Mark's getting promoted. Maybe our day now is going to become a cakewalk. So it's really interesting uh, scenario of going through and trying to figure all this out as a leader. And of course, I went through this whole big roller coaster of turning into, you know, the kindest person ever. And then I became the troll. I got so angry because I felt I was being taken advantage of and people were, you know, just using. I felt I was being used. And the number of times I turned to people and said, you have to listen to me. I'm your boss. <laughs> and anytime you have to use that phrase, anytime, I, I'm sorry, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a manager in a store, if you're the owner of the store, or if you're the president of the United States. If you turn around and say, you have to listen to me. I'm the president of the United States. You have to respect me. Well, then you know you're on the wrong track because what you're initially trying to do is you are trying desperately to hang on to the power that you think you have. And one thing about leadership, more than anything else, and I know that when we get to touch base with John Hansen, that it's going to be corroborated, is that leadership is not a role. It's a mindset. We, I know people who work in various different areas of, of an organization, and they have no formal authority. Nobody promoted them. Nobody did anything. But yet, they're still able to turn around and say something and people respect them, people follow them, people take leads from them, and at the end of the day, they still have no authority. So why is that? Why is it that some people in who have the formal authority can't lead, but yet other people at different levels are people that other people respect, other people will follow, other people will turn to in, in cases of um, change or in cases of uncertainty. And so, Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the things, um, some of the components of leadership. And again, this is just my input. This is just from my experiences. Uh, to be absolutely honest with you, this is off the cuff. You're going to see me looking down a little bit on a couple of notes that I do have. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, this is um, something that I want to tell you about because I think it's important for somebody who's been there, who's done that, who's bought the T-shirt. <laughs> to be able to talk with you about this because I know that even today, people I talk to, leaders I talk to today get frustrated with their staff, they get frustrated with the conditions, they get frustrated with their business, and they get burnt out because of all that stress. As a leader, you can take steps to mitigate some of that. So first off, I, I just want to say, you know, I, I think that, that leaders have three core roles. Uh, more than anything else, I think if you want to look at yourself as a, as a leader, and if you look at anybody who's got the moral authority to be a leader, they have three key components, and that is they inspire, they empower, and they innovate. And sometimes that innovate is through teaching, it's through um, kind of how, encouraging you to do your best. And so, so if we talk about the inspirational side first, um, let's talk a little bit, what does it mean to inspire? Well, well, first of all, it's important that leaders become value-based. It's not do this, do this, do this. It's more as much about giving back as it is taking the end result. And I think that's a really important component. Uh, you, we inspire as leaders, we inspire by sharing our vision, sitting down with people. And I'll never forget the very first time that I sat down with my team and I said, we have a problem and I need your input. And they looked up at me and they said, but Mark, you're the boss. And when I started telling them about how they're on the front lines, how every single day they're the ones dealing with the customers, they're the ones dealing with the end result, the end product. And I don't care if this was a hotel or a restaurant or a casino. The people who were there at, on the ground floor, I felt, had more information than I did. And so when we're able to say, you know, what the vision is and we're able to sit down with our people and say, what do you think your role is in helping make this vision come true? And, you know, again, I, I see it time and time again. I see it in mission statements about people wanting 
uh, shareholder equity to be is on their mission statement. We are here to ensure we take, you know, our shareholders will will have a return on investment, that our employees will stay employed, and that our guests will get served. Well, I think as as an order, I think it's all wrong. Because first and foremost, I think it must start with the end result being the guest. The shareholders, as far as I'm concerned, should be on the back burner. They should be way over here because they reap the reward of everything that happens here. If we take care of our employees, if we empower our employees, if we create an environment, a culture that they want to play in, and then they go face to face with the customer. And because of that, the customer keeps coming back, they keep spending more, and we end up with this huge return on investment, the people over here are gonna be just fine. We don't have to make shareholder equity part of our mission statement. As we create the shared vision, it's really important that we create focus and alignment. And this is where, uh, if you check out my blog at markhain.com, I wrote something about the end of the annual evaluation. Because one of the challenges I have with the annual evaluations is it becomes a process that is dictated through policy rather than through need. And one of the things that I suggested in the blog post is that we get rid of the annual evaluation and turn it into, create every leader in our organization becomes a team leader. And as a team leader, we're responsible for mentorship, we're responsible for uh, coaching. And so instead of having these annual evaluations, we actually sit down with people and actually have face-to-face, one-on-one time with them to be able to coach performance, find out where they're at, find the synergy between you and your employees. And then once you can do that, you can use those regular one-on-ones to create focus, alignment, and accountability. You can keep going, you know, here's, here's the objective. Last time we talked, this was what you said you wanted to do. Where are you at with that? Uh, we do- talked about the need to generate this. How are you doing with that? Is there anything holding you back? Do you have any barriers in the way? Are there anything that I can do to help move you forward and help move you? What resources do you need? So I think by doing that, we constantly are reinforcing exactly what the focus and the alignment is. As a leader, you know, we all hear, we all hear the thing, it starts at the top. And it's so funny that when I do training for intact teams, I'll I'll go in and I'll uh, talk with team members. It could be about customer service. It could be internal customer service, which is how we treat one another inside our culture. It could be dealing with difficult people, whatever, whatever the context is. Inevitably, somebody in the group will turn around and go, gosh, I wish my boss was here to hear this. That's scary. When they turn around and go, my goodness, you're teaching us this with the customers? How about they do this with us? You're telling us how to behave with one another, and yet our boss is not here to learn this. How are you prioritizing culture if you're not part of that training with them? And that's one of the things that I used to tell leaders is like, if you're not there, how do you know what to reinforce? How do you know what to reward? How do you know when we're on the right track if you're not there to be part of this conversation? It's no longer this top-down mentality at all. It's more, I'm looking you straight in the eye. I am here one-on-one with you and making that work. We have to create strength. Now, the strength is not our strength as leaders necessarily, but it's how we entice and pull out the strength from other people. It's having the humility to know that you don't have all the answers. Imagine that. You don't have all the answers. And again, this was a culture shock when I went up to my employees and I said, guys, I really, I don't know what to do here. Let's, let's sit down together and let's brainstorm this. And they couldn't believe that their boss didn't have all the answers. Now, if I was challenged by the humility factor, maybe I wouldn't have come to them. But if I hadn't come to them, I would have had to just make stuff up. And we would have floundered forward. And we would have tried just to figure it out, and then that would have been it. It's important that, as I think, as leaders, I think one of the number one virtues any leader could have is this idea of humility. Is that we check our ego at the door, my philosophy has always been that I work with my staff. In fact, it was so, it was so interesting. I, I was invited to a wedding for one of my employees and I went, I was honored to be invited. 
And I was sitting with some staff members and we were talking this and that. And then the bride saw me and said, oh, Mark, 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 I have to, I have to introduce you to my parents. And she invited me, pulling me by the hand, going, mom, dad, mom, dad, this is my boss, Mark. And I thought that was really interesting because never in our relationship had I ever mentioned I was the boss. I had never, ever turned to her and said that you need to respect me or listen to me because I'm the manager. In fact, when people used to talk to me before, I, before this girl came up and pulled me to her parents, I was sitting at a table with people I didn't know. And they said, oh, well, how do you know her? And I said, well, I work with her. I'm saying I work with her, and she's saying I'm her boss. And I thought that was a really interesting definition, or really, like it's a different way of kind of looking at this, because at no point did I ever outline that I was the boss. Yes, I had the, the job description of general manager, so yes, this is probably her perception of it. But in my mind, she's not my employee. She's a member of my team. She's a person I work with. But I have the humility to say that the, my role is really no different than the role that they have. The job descriptions are different, but they're not less or more important than me because, of, because I'm the general manager. And I think this is where the humility comes in from. I think really good leaders kind of set that job, uh, that title aside and say that I work with this person. In order to drive this humility, have this humility, it's really important that we create two-way trust. It's, it has to be an open book. It has to be something that you're transparent enough that when you say something, they turn around and they say, okay, fine. I worked in a casino that was uh, chartering. They were chartering to become unionized. There was all sorts of stuff going on internally outside of my department. And it was a really difficult, really difficult time to build trust. It was because you had one side. I mean, it's like anything. It's like COVID-19 right now with mask mandates and vaccine passports and all that. It's like the political systems. You know, you have one party against another party. When things get unionized, you get for and against. And when that happens, it absolutely breaks down your teams and the culture that you're living in. And it became a really, really tough situation. But having said that, we knew um, that the best thing I could do as a leader was to make absolutely sure I was fair and honest and transparent with everybody, no matter what. And because of that, in spite of having 300 discipline actions throughout the course of the year, not one of them ever went to the union, to the union rep. Not one of them ever got, content, got contentious, and we never once had to do anything. People understood that there was cause and consequence to every action. And because of that, we because of the way that we ran the department, we built that level of trust because there was no perception of favoritism. There was, it didn't matter if, if I was desperate for staff. If I had to send somebody home and I was desperate for staff, they got sent home. It, there was no defining personal agenda to make sure that my comfort was ensured versus doing what the right thing was to do. As leaders, we drive the momentum. So we're creating all this, all this components. We're driving all this uh, aspect of leader of uh, our operation through kind of the 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 prioritizing the culture and we're creating accountabilities and so on. So we can drive momentum for it the whole time. And this is really where we walk the talk. This is where when we say something, people can see that that's the way we act. And and again, that leads into this idea of building trust. The other thing that I think is really, really in crucial, absolutely crucial, is that you're the role model. You should become, you should be the leader that everybody wants to be when they grow up, <laughs> if you want to call it that. Uh, it's, it's essential that people can look back at you and say, no matter what happened, he was always fair, he was always honest, he was the kind of person that we knew we could turn to, and I know so many great people in leadership roles who are like this, but I also know that the flip side is true. I saw a, a really interesting meme about, about leadership versus managers. And, you know, the, the meme was, you know, the person stepping on other people to get to the top was the manager. And yet the other person who um, was the leader was the person who had his hands clasped and helping people reach their own heights. And so it's, you know,
is really at the end of the day, it's not about how well you do, it's about how well your team does. And again, I think that it's all a spinoff. It's all this, like this domino. If you make sure that they do well, right, they, they will lift you. Raising tides lift all boats. They will bring you up along with them and you with them. And so this is the idea that if we can create those connections with our employees, if we can sit down and have those one-on-ones with them, if we understand what they're doing, what they want to do, what their goals, what their aspirations are and so on, where they want to go, then before we know it, we have a pool of people who we know that we can invest in development. And again, that's one of those things <laughs> when it comes to the development aspect uh, that, uh, you know, what happens if I train them and they leave? And the scarier part is what happens if you don't train them and they stay? <laughs> and that's always something that kind of just rubs me the wrong way. I want to get a little bit into the empowerment side of what we're talking about today. And we'll do that right after this. When the spotlight shines on your business, are customers applauding or yawning? In other words, how is your business performing? Make your business a star with the new book, Lights, Camera, Action, Business Operational Excellence Through the Lens of Live Theater by Mark Hain. Mark uses his business and acting experience to help you see your business like a live show so you can create a performance your customers will never forget. Buy Lights, Camera, Action today at your favorite online retailer or directly at markhain.com. Welcome back. We're talking about leadership. Oh, I have my my guest split thing there. Let me switch back to that uh, because my guest unfortunately couldn't connect just yet. So we will connect at a later date. I know that uh, John Hansen. I'm, I'm hoping you're watching this, John. I'm hope I'm doing you proud. But at the end of the day, John is is working on a brand new book. He's got a whole theory around heroic leadership, which is something which is really close to my heart. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to an episode where I can sit down with him and have a, a nice chat about all this. Uh, we, we just talked about this idea of inspiring others. And now I want to touch a little bit on this idea of empowering others. We, I talked about this idea of, you know, using humility to draw the best out of your team. But once we get to do that, it's time for us to be able to go through and talk to our team and develop our team and drive our team to the point where we empower others to be great. I had an episode with Chris, Chris Nielsen who talked to Nielsen, sorry, I had an episode with Chris Nielsen who was talking about how we can use improv in our businesses. And improv relies heavily on the yes and philosophy. That is the yes and is the, the idea behind improv is that you never counter or conquer somebody else. If somebody else starts a scene in improv, your role is to say yes and and continue forward. Now, you might not say it necessarily, but the one thing you don't do, you're never ever turning around and saying, no, that's just stupid. Unfortunately, in our day and age, a lot of leaders take a look at the, at the feedback that they're getting from the teams, and instead of stopping and listening to what is being said, they throw through their own agenda and they say, no, that, that won't work, forget it. And the yes and philosophy takes a look and it says, okay, let's play yes and on this. Let's see what this might look like. Here's our objective. Here's the idea. How do the two match together? How can we make them match together? How can it work? And, you know, at the end of the day, when, when somebody comes forward with an idea and they turn around, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize we had to do that. No, I guess it won't work. They do it on their own. So one of the key components of being able to empower other people is to really lead from behind. Um, a very simple customer service uh, transaction that I did, I went into a hardware store, I bought a piece of plumbing. Uh, it was a two, inch, a two inch connector, but it was supposed to be one and three quarters. I bought it, I went to the car, I had the piece in the car, I was too lazy to come out and get it and I saw that it was the wrong piece, I went right back into the hardware store and I said to the lady at the desk, I'm terribly sorry, I bought the wrong one. Can I just exchange it? They're the same price. Oh, I'm sorry, you have to go to the back, to the customer service. It's like, okay. So I went to the back, to the customer service. And I stood there and I waited and I waited. And finally somebody came out and how can I help you? I said, well, I bought this and I need the other one. I need the smaller one. They're both the same price. They're both 99 cents. And she says, oh, okay, uh, no problem. And so she flucks through some papers and hands me a form, says, can you please fill this out? 
mm, okay. <laughs> so I filled it out and I thought, this is a lot of work for a 99 cent piece. And I said, great. So can I just go, oh, no, no, you have to take this now to the cash and she'll process a refund for you. I said, but all I want to do is exchange it. And she goes, I'm sorry, this is, this is our policy. And so I took the thing, waited in line to go to the cash, got the thing, got the refund, and then I could go and I can buy my next, my, the product that I wanted. And so here's a perfect example of a scenario where we don't have trust necessarily in our people. Uh, I've known time and time and time again that employees are not empowered to be able to make decisions. Um, they're not empowered to fix things for customers. And when I think about this idea of empowerment, this is one of the first stories that always comes to mind because I've seen this time and time again. Um, a cell phone supplier. Um, when I, I was with Fido for years, I was I had really great service with them. And when it came time to renew and stuff, I had some issues I needed to, to resolve. And I went to the customer service. I'm terribly sorry. There's nothing we could do. And they switched me off to loyalty. And they said, I'm terribly sorry. There's nothing we can do. And I went back and forth. And I said, here's the deal. If I'm not satisfied, I am going to take my business somewhere else. And the person on the phone said, I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Hayden. There's nothing we can do. Fair enough. I said, I've given you enough warning. I've told you what the outfall is going to be, and that's fine. If that's, if that's the end result, so be it. I was a customer for 13 years, and I moved over to a competitor. Within 10 days of canceling my contract and moving on to a new supplier, I got a call from the, from the company, from the uh, old company, uh, saying, oh, Mr. Hain, we see that you canceled your service and moved on. We're seeing that you have 13 years with us and that you've been a really good, loyal customer and we'd like to offer you a special. Really? <laughs> I gave you ample opportunity. And the response I got was, I said, why, why couldn't the customer service agent do this transaction for me? Oh well, you know, we can't we can't get it, we can't give everybody the power. And I thought, you can't give everybody the power to make your customers happy. And so this idea of being able to lead from behind means that you have to give structure to people. You have to be able to get, tell them how they they can react to stuff and you know, not be so afraid that people are going to make a mistake. I have an episode here, check it out if you haven't seen it with Celine Williams, and we talk about the outfall of failure and how to manage failure. Because what happens when somebody makes a mistake? The worst case scenario on the phone is that somebody would have made a mistake, it would have cost the company a few hundred dollars, let's say over the course of a two year contract. But at the end, I would be there two years from now saying, hey, let's renew, let's, let's keep on going. Let's continue the relationship. But instead, they decided to hang up the phone and let me walk away. Being able to empower your employees, nobody is going to turn around and say, hey, I can give away stuff. I'm just going to do nothing but give away stuff. If we do everything that came before, if we talked about, we talked about the inspire part of it, if people understand what you're out to do, nobody will come to work thinking, today, I'm going to see what I can do to screw everybody over. Right? Now, I'm not saying that there's not negative people on the planet. Not cr I'm not saying everybody is honest, but I think in general, the majority of people come to work wanting to do really well. And it's really important to, to give that power away. Those powers of, you know, where you had to wait for some and do something. You know, I was in, in a hardware store, um, like a big box hardware store, and we had to do something, and they had to wait for the manager to come to put the key in the slot to, to do the transaction. Uh, there was some sort of a discount thing, and I can't, I can't even remember what the details were. I just remembered having to wait as they go, manager to customer service, manager to customer service. And then I had to stand there and wait until all she had to do was just come in, oh, and click the key. It's like, why can't you get your employees to do that? You have the track records. You have the system in place to make sure that it's not a dishonest transaction. You can very well do that. At the end of the day, um, when it comes down to empowering people, 
it's about drawing out their strengths. It's about finding out where they feel weak at. And again, if you're doing the kind of this idea of two of coaching, um, I would even take it a step further and do a two way mentorship program. Do two ways of being able, again, being trans transparent with your staff, that you are able to have this open and honest conversation. And so they're frustrated about something, as something that keeps nagging at them. And you're there to listen and hear what they have to say. And then you can absolutely give your power away to say, if you were me, what would you want to do with it? And then weigh it against what are your objectives, what are your goals, what are your outcomes that you're looking for, and be able to drive it that way. I mentioned training. Nothing, nothing, nothing can happen without training. How many hours does a guitar player like Eric Clampton, how many hours of practice before he became Eric Clampton? <laughs> how many hours of practice did Santana do? You could go on and on and on. Stuff doesn't happen without practice. Stuff doesn't happen without failing and moving forward, failing and moving forward, failing and moving forward. And yet, we will bring somebody into our business, somebody who's got experience, and expect them to perform. And that's kind of like saying, um, you know, to a chef, hey, I'm so good you're a chef, great, we have a great recipe for, um, for Coquille Saint-Jacques, <laughs> and, uh, but we put it away, we hide it so nobody can see it, but you, you're an experienced chef, able to make it. Really? I've seen time and time again, especially in hospitality, where a server comes in, she's got experience in serving. Oh, well, you have experience serving, so you don't need training. So uh, there's the point of sale system. Here is your access card. Here's your apron. Go ahead. No training on menus, right? How many times have you gone in? What is the one response you get when you sit at a restaurant at lunch and say, what's the soup of the day? What do they say? Let me go check, <laughs> right? Each and every time. Why is that? Why is that th there's this thing, this lack of, of input to the development of your team? Take it a step further. You have these different people in your team. Where's the leadership training? Where's the communication training? Where's the stuff that you can do to invest in the growth of that particular person? Because I'll tell you, you know, nothing is more magical years after they've left you, that you hear from an employee and they say, Mark, because of what you did in this particular scenario, I became this. I did this. We're human beings. And so at the end of it, when you're driving through your personal objectives and your outcomes and your goals and so on, what about looking at how do we empower those to grow with you? At the end of the day, one of the ways that we have to do that, and this is, has to do with giving power away, is the fact that we need to absolutely manage the outcomes, not the activities. And this is what COVID has taught us this. Up until COVID-19, people were not working from home. They could not become remote workers. In fact, there was a, you know, when I worked for a municipality, there was this whole thing. If you're not at your desk, you're not working. I remember work, walking in after a 7 a.m. breakfast meeting, and I walked in at quarter to 10, and somebody looked at me and they go, hmm, well, that's nice. But, you know, our day starts at 8.30. They had no perception that I started my day actually at 7 o'clock with a client, uh, sitting down to a breakfast meeting with this person until I got in till at a, at a quarter to 10. No, no, it wasn't fathomed. And so I always thought this idea about, you know, if I can sit at my desk and do the work on my computer, why can't I sit at home and do the work on my computer? What is this need for me to actually enter a building, to set, sit in a cubicle, to do the work that I'm just as capable of doing back home? And of course, that all comes down to trust. It all comes down to being able to know that people are doing the work. We have to get out of this micromanaging mindset that if people aren't here, that they're not working. I do know in many, many situations that people are sitting at their desk they're still not working. They're checking Amazon. 
They're Googling stuff. They're on Instagram. There's all sorts of stuff that are there to distract them. And so you don't necessarily get a full eight hours while people are sitting in their little cubicle. But it's really important that we start managing the outcomes. We start looking. This is what us. You know, we have really capable people sitting in their houses now generating content and generating stuff. And on top of it all, I saw a statistic that people are working about 2.7 hours more per day. Now, not that that's healthy, but that just goes to show the level of commitment that people have. Now that I have the tools here, you know what, I have this project, I really want to work on it, and they continue working on it. There are actually a lot of talk among human resource professionals right now talking about how do we stop our employees from working when they're at home, when they're remote working. How do we stop it? How do we cut it off so that they can have a life because it's not healthy that they work that extra 2.7 hours? So we know people are driven to perform if you give them the chance. Oh, sorry, I lost my mouse. Um, as part of this empowerment, the one area I think that I was magically surprised with, uh, I, again, I grew up in, in working in hospitality. There was a lot of like secrets, a lot of things held cl close to the chest when it came down to uh, hospitality. A perfect example is I worked in a community and, you know, every night we would get into the car and we'd drive to other properties to count how many cars they had in their parking lot just to see what the volume was for the day and where do we rate as far as occupancy was concerned. And I would see other managers from other hotels driving through our parking lot, one, two, three, four, five, five. And, and so then I, I, I called up and sent them all an email and I said, you know, why don't we just publish our occupancy? And everybody turned around. It was like I was on crack. Their hands on, oh, how can we, no way, you're going to steal our customers. If you know how many customers we are, you're going to steal our customers. And it's like, but we already know the information. We're already going through and counting cars and having reports and having spreadsheets with all the numbers on it so that we can see it. So we're already doing it. It's why don't we collaborate? And maybe then we can all rise. <laughs> and it's the same thing with our staff. Holding information back because you don't want them to know it. Uh, and I, again, a chef holding a recipe aside and nobody else can make this recipe. He'll have people put some things together, but then he'll go in and sneak in and, and make, the, make the recipe. Well, nobody else knows it. So there's no succession planning. There's no way that that chef can ever be more than a cook because he's always going to be called to make this particular product. And so the chef in his own kind of guarding, I want to make myself indispensable, is then treating his staff like they don't matter, that the only thing that matters is him. He's making himself indispensable, but then he's also hindering his growth. By driving collaboration, you get people to work together. And, you know, a magical thing happens when you bring a small, dedicated group of people together to start talking about a problem. I could not believe it. I could not believe that I went through when I was working in a casino and I wanted to do a train the trainer program. I had no budget. And so I went to the staff and I said, you know, I'm, I got this thing. I'd love to train you guys to be trainers, but I have no staff and I, I, I can't pay you to take the training. And so, you know, I'm going to hold the course for whoever wants it. I have a maximum of 12 people that I can do in this. And people were going, eh, it's not paid, nah, 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 and they didn't bother. Six people did, though. Six people came to the first training because they wanted, to, they wanted their work environment to be better. They wanted to be able to grow. They wanted to be able to do it. And they, so they committed to this training on their own dime. And after they had the very first three-hour session with me, they went back in the very next day and they were talking to everybody about how great it was and how, you know, all the different things that they got out of it. And it was thrilling. And you could see that they were pumped. And that day, I had eight more people come to me and say, Mark, can I join the training? I only had room for 12. I had to say no to two people. When we give people a chance to come together, yes, people want value. People want to get something out of it. People want to benefit in some, some form or fashion. But when you bring collaboration together, all of a sudden, it's like my ideas matter. I matter. I am a participant in this endeavor.
And that to me is just magical. I hope this is making sense to you. I'm not seeing, I'm seeing some thumbs up in the comments. I'm not seeing any comments. Uh, let me just double check. Oh, uh, ex yeah. Um, <laughs> John is joining as a, John, I hope I'm doing well. <laughs> this is just off the cuff with a little list that I have that I can just talk to. And I lo definitely look forward to, um, to coming on and having you come on the show and we could talk about heroic leadership. I do want to get into innovation and talk a little bit more about what it takes for leaders to innovate with their teams. And we'll get to that right after this. When you're delivering an important speech to a huge audience, it's easy to lose your place or go way over time. Give yourself an advantage with the Pro Speaker Presentation Speech Timer app. No more checking your watch or calling for time. The Pro Speaker Presentation Speech Timer app keeps you on track with easy to see timers, even changing color for visual prompts during your speech. And you can set audio cues to practice or set it to vibrate so you don't even have to look. Be the pro you know you are. Download the app at speakerpresentationtimer.com. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. I have to I have to publish this because this is John from Accelerated Revenue says I'm doing great. And he says I must have ad-libbed before. Yes, yes, ad-libbing is something that we do as a Toastmaster. This is, you know, we do table topics, which teaches us to ad-lib a little bit. So all you need is just a little bit of a heading and then you share your stories. And that's hopefully what I'm doing for you today. And I'm hoping that you're getting huge value from it as well. Thank you very much, uh, John, for that. Um, let me just... Great. Um, so as I mentioned bef um, before, you know, we have... So we have Inspire, we have Empower. The next phase is to this idea of innovation. How do you drive innovation as a leader? And for me, this is the one closest to my heart because I think this is, as leaders, is why we're here. If we were here just to make sure that buttons went on a shirt, and that was all our, you know, that we are looking over people's shoulder to make sure that the button is going on the shirt. Then at the end of the day, who are we and why do they need us? I always say that the best customer service is always when things go wrong. And likewise, the best leadership qualities show when things go horribly, horribly wrong. And so one of the things about the innovation side of it is this idea that we can, we can put our toe into the water and test new ideas. Uh, we can take a look at what we're doing and saying, is this the best that we can do? Is this the, the as far as we can push the envelope? Now, I did have an episode that I, I talked about this idea, the three keys to um, creating exceptional experiences. And so please go ahead and view that. But one of the key components there was this idea of caring. And, you know, when you're caring for the outcomes, when you're caring for the people involved, when you're caring for the you know, the customer experience, the, the side of who's going to benefit from your contribution, then I think you come up with a much big, bigger process, a uh, bigger um, outcome and, and a bigger end result. And so one of the things that I think we need to do is we need to embrace change. Um, again, COVID-19 has done nothing but prove how volatile our reality is. And I talked with David Guthrow in, in another episode, uh, talking about VUCA, which is the military term for you know, the, the volatility and it's, it's a whole big acronym on how that really we should be looking at change as being the norm. Things will always change. You know, right now as this episode uh, is this past weekend um, where this episode is airing, uh, we had we had all sorts of things going on in this southern states. Um, Hurricane Ida. I think, or I think it's Hurricane Ida, uh, was making landfall and all the all the damage and everything that happens, you know, and I, the people have to adjust. They have to change. COVID, we had to adjust. We had to change. The ones who couldn't adjust and change, those were the ones who kind of petered out and closed their doors and walked away um, because they didn't necessarily have the, the seed for innovation. If you've ever heard of the, the theory of... Um, Minimal viable product, MVP, minimal viable product, uh, is this idea that you can try things. You don't have to come up with the whole solution. And this is a thing when it comes to, to problem solving is that you can look at one little aspect and say, you know what, let's give this a try and see what happens. And then from there, you gain data and you say what worked, what didn't work. But you have to be afraid 
you, you, or you, you have to be willing to face the failure aspect of it. But what is better, to invest a small amount of money to test and fail at a small amount, or to go through and create this whole big program where you've invested tons of money, tons of man hours, you, you've tried to extrapolate every contingency humanly possible, only to realize that you did it for nothing. I suggest that it's probably better to start with the small outlay, a test, another small outlay, another test, and so on. And so by prioritizing speed, you push people faster. By letting people fail, you push them faster. 3M is always is one of those stories that is, is magical because 3M was developed by a gentleman who was trying to create a great glue. And he created the glue that 3M uses now in the post-it notes and realized it's a really weak glue. This, it's horrible. It's a horrible glue. It's, it's terrible. And the formulation sat on the shelf for decades because the gentleman who was working on it was trying to get a really good bond. Years later, somebody came along and saw this formulation and thought, wow, you know what? And he came up with sticky notes. <laughs> Being able to be open to what is possible without shutting it down to say, oh no, it's a horrible formulation, it'll never work. I can tell you, I've been in businesses where I suggest something, they go, oh, we tried that 20 years ago, it didn't work. Well, maybe it was ahead of its time, right? And so we use, we tend to use um, the excuse to stay comfortable as opposed to get uncomfortable, and I think that's the big aspect. Time and time again, as I mentioned, you know, you can't do this without your people. And this is where I think you need to prioritize your talent. You need to be able to tap into the, the brilliance that's on your team because you hired them for something. You hired your people for something. You saw something in them that you hired. So why not use them? Why not tap into that brilliance? That server who has all those years of experience, why don't you tap into that experience? Imagine what can happen. Imagine how you can push yourself forward. But you have to create, and this is going back to what we said with the culture. This goes back into creating the culture that is willing to make those changes. Leader, it's imperative that we not only lead to get over the obstacles that we're facing today, but we're looking at how can we drive the future. And if you just looking at what you do and you say, this is how we've always done it, this is and you don't start asking, is there a way that we can do this better? Is there something, something that I can do to make this a little bit better? There's the old adage out there that says, if it ain't fixed, don't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But what about testing? What about taking a look at something and saying, can we really do this a little bit better? And sometimes that requires that we reflect on ourselves. We reflect on who we are as individuals, who we are as leaders, um, who, what is our outcome? What, what, how do we denote success? If our success at the end of the day is that you get home and you go, man, that was a great day. I had a really great day, brought people together. We were, you know, we were brainstorming new solutions and that sort of thing. And I'm excited for tomorrow. Then we're on the right track. If you get home at the end of the day and go, oh my God, that was such a cog. That was horrible. Oh my God, I'm so exhausted. I'm so burnt out. Oh my God, that's absolutely then we need to take a look at what we're doing. We absolutely need to this level of self-reflection to find out what our purpose is. And please, 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 if you're a leader and you hate your life and you hate leading people and so on, find an alternative. I talked to one garage owner who um, is a, he's an entrepreneur, a solopreneur. He's got, he actually has uh, one or two mechanics working for him. And, and I took my car in to be fixed and, and he's a great mechanic. And when I came to pay the bill, he was sitting behind the desk doing all the work, right? Getting all the billings together. And then he handed me the, the debit machine and all that. And I said, hey, why don't you have somebody else to do this? And he said, well, because I used to have people. I used to have a girl here. Plus, I used to have five mechanics. But I spent all my time managing. I could never get to work on cars. And that's the reason why he opened his garage. So he's doing both dual duty right now. And I suggested to him, why don't you hire your boss. Hire somebody above you. Hire somebody who's going to drive your business that you're going to sit down with once a week to go over objectives and you're going to test and you're going to create accountabilities with this person to find out how we're doing. 
let that person come to you and say, hey, here's the next job. Here's the next thing I need you to do on the day-to-day -day stuff. But then you lead your business together with the capacity and the brilliance of somebody who is a specialist in running businesses. Wow, couldn't that just launch his business? So think of it from your point of view. I don't know where you're at in your world. I don't know where you're at as far as the scope of what your days look like. But if you have something that you feel is holding you back, has become an anchor that you can't pull away from, maybe we need to be looking outside. And I encourage you to check out my episode on coaching um, with uh, Jean Howard. It was a brilliant conversation. She's got some wonderful philosophies about how you how you need to have a coach or why you need to have a coach, indicators that you need a coach, and then how you go about trying to find one. Um, you know, I hope that this has been uh, of value to you. I, I realize this is an ad lib um, episode and uh, that you are not seeing John yet, but we will, I promise. Um, but I, ho I hope this makes sense to you, and I hope this is something that you could use um, to, to kind of do a little checklist, a little check-in with yourself and even with your team. And as I mentioned um, every episode, if you would like 30 minutes of my time to sit down with you and your team, brainstorm some solutions, take a look, you know, just even to have somebody to listen to kind of what your quandary is and what your challenges are, uh, maybe just by brainstorming uh, with you and your team, we could come up with some ideas and solutions to help maybe that you could test to move you forward. It's been an absolute pleasure doing this episode with you. I hope, like I mentioned, my only hope is that you got some value from it. Uh, my name is Mark Hain. I am the service expert and master of experiences. I hope that you stay safe, stay healthy, and dare to be the exception. <laughs>